Good morning, church. I am giving honor and glory to the presence of the Holy Spirit with us today. Let us call, do the call to worship. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Know that the Lord is God. It is he that made us and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Giving. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. Let us begin with our opening hymn. Number 402, all praise to our Redeemer, Lord.
We honor your name. We give glory to your name, O oh God. You have made us. You have created everything that is by your word. We thank you, O oh God, for giving us life today that we can call upon your name we give you glory and praise. We confess our sins before you, Lord. We have not done all the things that you would have us do. We have not loved you as we ought. We have not spent enough time in your presence and we have sometimes fail to share our faith with others. We ask in your God to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Forgive us for our iniquities. Search our hearts and purify our minds and our thoughts. And may we have pure hearts as we come into your presence to worship you today. Father, you are so good to us. We say Abba Father because you are the one who cares for us, protects us, guides us. And we can just come as children to you, knowing that all that we need, we will receive from you as we ask in faith, believing. We praise you, Lord, because you have kept us and you have brought us another time into your house to give you praise and glory. We could have been in a sick bed in the hospital, but you have blessed us with life and health, and so we give you thanks. We thank you most of all, O oh God, for giving your son to bear our sin, to bear our punishment, that we could have free access into your presence, that we could be reconciled to you by his blood. We give you thanks, O oh God, for our home, Barbados, for keeping us in peace in this land, when there's so much turmoil all over the world, especially in countries like Israel and Gaza. And, but but we, Lord, we give you thanks because we are at peace today. And Lord, we submit this service to you. We ask in Lord that your Holy Spirit would fill this place with your presence, that our hearts would be turned and in tune with you so that we can worship you today in spirit and in truth. We thank you for all that is uh, that we are going to do today in this service. We present it to you, Lord, through the Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus. With thanksgiving. Amen. At this time, I'm going to call on the steward to bring us welcome, greetings, and notices. After that, we will have the blessing of tithes and offerings.
Good morning, church. It's good to see you here this Lord's Day. We hope that this service will be a blessing to everyone. Do we have any visitors? I don't have the names of anyone. Do we have any visitors? Join me in welcoming my aunt, Maureen St. Hill, visiting from California. <laughs> Birthday celebrations. We have another visitor. Yes, I'm seeing you, I'm seeing you, sorry. <laughs> Can you give us your name? I'm sorry, I'm not here for this far, but welcome. And we hope to see you again sometime soon. We also want to especially welcome our preacher for today, our own sister, Dr. Evelyn McCollin. Our birthday celebrations this week. On March 4th, Christina Leslie. March 6th, Brother Frederick Mosley, and on March 8th, Sister Cynthia Sobers. Do we have anyone else celebrating a birthday this week? Can we please have the birthday song? Anniversary celebrations, celebrating on the 5th of March, brother Hugh and sister Jean King. They will be celebrating 60 years. What a milestone.
60 years, you know, you all don't look more than 70. So you sure those are the right years? Amen. From celebration to condolences. The funeral service of Mr. Carl Ashby, he's the nephew of our sexton brother, Fennel Rice, will be held here on Tuesday, March 5th at 10 a.m. Please uplift his family in prayer. Prayers. Prayers are requested for our nation and people, those mourning the loss of loved ones, as well as the sick and homebound. We especially remember our sisters Verona Trotman, Cynthia Lane, and Patricia Felix, and our brothers Wilbert Small and Edward Hughes. We give God thanks and praise for their lives and work in our church and community. Our notices. On Tuesday, March 5th at 6.30 p.m., the Providence Congregational Pastoral Council will meet via the Zoom platform. The members of the council are the Congregational Stewards, the Baptismal Role Secretary, Class Leaders and Assistant Class Leaders, Care Fund Stewards, Membership Secretary, Secretary of the Council, and local preachers who are members of the congregation. The circuit, Bethel Circuit Lenten teaching sessions will continue on March 6th at 6.30 p.m. And this will continue every Wednesday. On March 6th, the venue is Dalkeith. The topic will be prayer and study. The devotions will be done by Brother Ryan Brewster and the presenter will be our Superintendent, Reverend Adrian S. Odell. On the 13th of March, the venue will be Vauxhall. The topic will be worship and fellowship. Brother Jason Clark will lead the devotions and the presenter will be our own brother, Michael Worrell. And on the 20th of March, here at Providence, the topic will be repentance and obedience. It will be, devotions will be led by our sister, Dr. Evelyn McCollin, and the presenter will be Sister Unka Daniel. On Thursday, March 7th, from 10 a.m. until noon, Sunlight Bible Study continues, and this is facilitated by our Reverend Pearson Blackman. Also on Thursday, March 7th, at 7.30, the Bethel Circuit Prayer Meeting will be held via the Zoom platform. On Saturday, March 9th, at 9 a.m. until 3 p.m., the Circuit Day of Prayer and Fast will be held at Vauxhall Chapel. All congregants are encouraged to attend. Uh, so in, as a consequence of that, our prayer meeting on Saturday morning will be canceled. On Sunday, March 10th, the fourth Lord's Day in Lent, our Superintendent Reverend Adrian Odell will be the preacher at our 9 a.m. communion service. The readings are as listed. On Saturday, March 16th at 8 a.m., the Bethel Mission and Evangelism Committee will host their prayer breakfast in the Donald Henry Auditorium. The featured speaker will be Reverend Dr. Adrian Smith of the Calvary Moravian Church. This event is free and the deadline for indicating your attendance is March 10th. Soulful Soup Sunday. It's here again on March 30th at the Donald Henry Auditorium and Grounds. This is at the Bethel Methodist Church and it's from 11 a.m. until 2 p.m. You can get, you can visit the Health Corner and stir your souls by celebrating our young artists, Hallam Roach, Aimon Paris, Kian Brown, and the South District 
youth band as they minister to you on that day. Tickets at a cost of $20 will be available soon. These are our notices. We ask God's blessing on the notices. Remember that additional information is posted on the notice board or available on our website at www.provmethchurchbb.com. Thank you. Have a blessed week. Let us receive the offerings and tithes. Father in heaven, we thank you that you have given us strength and power to work or to receive or to do business or in whatever way you have provided finances for us. We thank you that we are privileged to give a portion of it back to you. We ask you to receive it and bless it and increase it to its use. Bless those that had to give and those who did not have, prepare, provide for them also. We ask this in the name of Jesus with thanksgiving, amen. At this time, we are going to worship and praise the Lord as we invite the worship team to come and lead us in a few songs of worship and praise. Let's say good morning to the church. This is the day the Lord has made. Isaiah 42 verse 8 says, I am Jehovah, that is my name. And my glory will I not give to another, neither my praise unto graven images. Amen? Amen. This morning we are going to sing Jehovah, Jehovah is your name.
And by special request, I know we signed this last week, Psalm 34, but we'll sing it again because <laughs> every day we must seek the Lord. I sought the Lord and he answered me and he delivered me from every fear. Amen.
Amen. Hallelujah. And by special request, there were sister Evelyn has asked that we sing I am a warrior once again so we are going up amen providence are you going up amen. are we are going up together
where you may face this week, just remember the words of that song. You are a warrior. You are a conqueror. You are an overcomer. In the name of the Lord, the Lord. Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. worship team to do that song again because when we are children of God we are more than conquerors through Christ and I, at this point I think someone would have a testimony about being a conqueror and an overcomer so can we have a testimony or a word a scripture verse from someone? Anybody wants to talk about being an overcomer? None? Amen. Now this time I Oh, okay, we have another testimony. Good morning, Providence. Come on, we must not be afraid to share what the Lord has done. So when we talk about overcoming, let me just share with you all, because I was reminding the children this week that Jesus saved them. Amen? Amen? So when my first daughter was being born, she was our first child, and my wife went into labor, the cord had wrapped around her neck. So what it was, it was we had to go into an emergency C-section. Because if the cord was not removed with the baby in labor, well, you would imagine what would happen. So the, the, the thing about that is that before that event, God had showed us in a dream something like this was going to happen. And in that moment, we remembered the dream and we were comforted and we knew that all was going to be well, even though that Amaya was in real danger. So I know that God saved her. Amen? Amen. And where the devil wanted to take her out before she was born, here she is with us. And to talk about overcoming, my son now, yeah, give God a praise, give God a clap for that. And my son now, when he was born, uh, the children reminded me, that time we were going whole town, that daddy, you would get up, or well, my daughter, you would get up and share. And I got up in, in, in front of the congregation, and I cried because my son had eczema very badly. So much that we had to wrap his hands as a baby. You had to sleep with him and hold his hands that he could not scratch his skin because you can't tell a baby not to scratch. And it was very, very difficult for us. I, I mean, looking back at it, no, it's, 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 it's a vague memory. But when we were through it, it was very real for us. We were very tired. We were going to specialists. And today my son has no eczema. And he eats and drinks what he wants and runs around. No one has to hold him. He sleeps by himself. And they give God all the thanks. Because it was, in a, it was in a service just like this that persons prayed for us. And at that time, persons reminded me that, listen, God is going to deliver you. And I stand here this morning as testimony of that because you can see my children, they're alive, they're well, praise and they give God all the praise. Praise the Lord. Praise Lord. Wonderful testimony. God gets the glory when we talk about his wonderful works. Anybody else want to say something at this point? If you wander off the road to the right or to the left, you will hear a voice behind you saying, here is the road, follow it. Thank you, thank you, thank you for that word. Do we have a little boy here who wants to say something? Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. He's brave. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. It takes a lot of courage to come up here and say that. God saves us when things are tough and when you need it most. God is there for you when you need it, and he is always your child. God made you, and he loved you, and he wants to make you have a good life. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you. 
and just as a small, a small testimony in connection with, with our Aidan. He, he was feeling a little stuffy this morning and he really wanted to go outside. He wanted to go and sit. But you know, God had a reason for him to come back in here and say something. So I thank God that we were able to overcome that little episode and that he is back in here and God had a message for somebody through him. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Anybody else has a scripture verse or testimony? I, okay, I think at this point I would like to say a prayer for those people who are celebrating birthdays this week and also our couple here who are celebrating their 60th anniversary. So I don't know if you want to come forward. Any birthdays? Birthday celebrants? No? <clears throat> Praise the Lord. Oh. oh, God and Father. We give you thanks, Lord, for this couple who you have kept together for 60 years of marriage. That is such a testimony and a wonderful example. Lord God in heaven, bless them today. Give them a special blessing, Lord. Bind them even closer with your cause of love that cannot be broken. And whatever is their need today, whether it's financial or physical or whatever, we present the need to you, Lord, and we ask you to meet that need, even as they look up to you in faith, to receive from you today. Blessings upon them, in Jesus' name, amen. Bless the Lord for you. Y'all want to give a testimony? So. <laughs> Y'all want to tell us something? Y'all have something to say? You want to share with us? Anything? <laughs> about, what, about what it means or how, how did you manage to go that long, married, six years? We were glad to hear from
I would like to I would like to share a little word. Thank you so much for your song. Great is thy faithfulness. God has been faithful to you all of these years. He's been faithful to all of us. We must give him thanks. I want to share a little bit with the children. If the children would, would the children like to come up front here so I could talk to you? All right, I'll talk to you from up here, all right? Bless the Lord for the little children. All right, children, today, how are you all? I want to talk to you a little bit about how Jesus cleared the temple which is the, another name for the house of God. And, okay, y'all listening? Okay. One day Jesus went into the temple in Jerusalem where they used to worship. And he found a lot of animals, in the temple and people selling money, changing money, making a big profit from the people who were coming to, in the temple to serve God, you know, to worship. And he got very angry. Are you listening? Now, do you think that it is okay to get angry? You think so? How many of you have got have um, have been angry with somebody? <laughs> everybody, everybody has been angry. So, you think I being angry is okay? It's not. Why do you think it's not? Okay. All right. Anybody else want to say why you sh should not, should or should not get angry? What? That is so interesting. She said that anger is an emotion and you can, you know, time, bring it down by counting to five. All right, then she's giving some different um, examples of being angry, yes? Yes, yeah, some. You show that she said that you show that people when you get angry. That is true, but um, when Jesus got angry, he 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 saw some things that he didn't like. He didn't like how the people were behaving in the temple, and he got so it's all right to get angry for a good reason. Jesus was angry because the people were doing wrong, and he wanted to correct that. Oh, great. 
great. Yeah, that is a, I am going to talk about that more of that in my sermon today. She's saying that they were in the market, they were making the place a market, and that is not what the house of God should be, because it was a place to worship God. Hello, you just joined, you have anything to say about why you, about being angry, whether you can be angry or sh you shouldn't be angry. <laughs> but another thing I want to tell you, um, the way we're talking about anger, is a lot of things happen in school. Have you seen ch children in school getting angry and getting out of control? You want to talk about it? Mm -hmm. You want to say something about it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. So there are times when you get angry, but you have to control it. Not to um, go on and then, you know, a lot of children, you hear about people killing, stabbing each other and doing some terrible things to each other out of anger. But, you know, we don't want to explode like that. Yes. It's a wonderful definition there. He says anger is when you can't take control of your emotions. So we have, we are human, we have emotions. Jesus was God in a body, in his body, and he was human. He had human feelings, just as how we have human feelings. Yes? You want people to be kind to you? Pardon? Yes, you have something more? You may sing. Break things. Oh, you get mad and start throwing things around. Yes, if you let the anger get out of control, as you said, you can't control yourself and then you will get into trouble. And a lot of people today are getting into trouble because they're getting, their ang they're getting angry and letting the anger come out of control. But Jesus had a purpose in getting angry because he wanted to fix something that wasn't going right in the church. All right, anybody else? All right, let's have a little short prayer. Father God, we thank you for these young people, these children, and we thank you that you are opening their understanding, that they can understand what is going on around them and understand your word and what you have to say about how they should behave. We pray that you will give them grace and, and help them that when they go to school and other people are getting angry and wanting to fight, that they would still be able to exercise self-control. In Jesus' name we pray. Bless them today, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you for your sharing and your contribution. Yes? Yeah? You have some hands, too? Right, he says you need to know how to have control and discipline over your anger. These young people are very wise. Thank you so much. Or you may go back to your seats. Oh, we have a song to sing for the young people. Um, you can go, you can go back to your seat, and we can sing. There, there is a name I love to hear. Hymn number forty-one.
At this time, we're going into the ministry of the word, and we begin with the call it and the Old Testament reading by Sister Megan Goodrich. We then we'll have the Psalm by Sister Sharon Campbell, the Epistle by Sister Suzanne King, and then we'll have the ministry of the choir before we get the gospel reading. Let us pray the call it together. Almighty God, whose most dear son went not up to joy, but first he suffered pain and entered not into glory before he was crucified. Mercifully grant that we, walking in the way of the cross, may find it none other than the way of life and peace. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Old Testament reading is from Exodus chapter 20, reading from verse 1 to verse 17. The Ten Commandments. Then God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above, or that is on the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for the iniquity of parents to the third and fourth generation of those who reject me, but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord, your God. For the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the Sabbath day is a Sabbath to the Lord, your God. You shall, do, you shall not do any work. You, your son or your daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock, or the alien resident in your towns. For in six days, the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, but rested the Sabbath day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. Honor your father and your mother, so that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or male or female slave, or ox, or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Psalm 19. The heavens are telling the glory of God, and the firmament proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours forth speech, 
and night to night declares knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard. Yet, their voices go out through all the earth, and the words to the end of the world. In the heavens, he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom from his wedding canopy, and like a strong man runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens, and its circuit to the end of them, and nothing is hid from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The decrees of the Lord are sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is clear, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover by them is your servant warned, and keeping them there is great reward. But who can detect their errors? Clear me from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from the insolent. Do not let them have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Please stand for the Gloria. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, word without end. Amen. This morning's epistle is taken from Corinthians chapter 1, verses 18 to 25. Christ, the power and wisdom of God. For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scholar? Where is the debater of the age? God Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, God decided through the foolishness of the proclamation to save those who believe. For Jesus, for Jews, ask for signs, and Greeks desire wisdom. But we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. But to those who are called Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power and wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. This is the word of God. A musical selection, a musical, a musical selection by the choir.
Praise the Lord. Thank you, choir, for that beautiful rendition. You took me back to the days of Mahalia Jackson. The gospel reading. We stand for the gospel reading, and then that will be followed by the hymn of preparation. The gospel is according to John chapter 2, reading from verse 13 to 22. <clears throat> the Passover of the Jew was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cars, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coin of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, this temple had been under construction for 46 years and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scriptures and the word that Jesus had spoken. This is the gospel of Christ. Our hymn of preparation is number two, three, three, take my life and let it be.
Thank you. You may be seated. It's a pleasure to be here today to share the word with my family. And I want to thank all of you who are present today. I want to thank all of those who have helped in making this service a success. I want to thank the stewards, or the steward, the organist, the drummer, the choir, the readers, and the tech team, and all those who had a part in serving in this service today. Let us pray. Almighty God and Father, I come to you now, Lord, in the name of Jesus, with thanksgiving. Thanking you, Lord, for your word that you're going to feed us with through the Holy Spirit's inspiration. Lord, let the Holy Spirit, I submit myself to you that the Holy Spirit will fill my mind, my thoughts, and speak through my lips with clarity and understanding. Open our hearts to receive your word, to lighten our pathway as we walk this pilgrim journey. We ask it in the name of Jesus, amen. My text is based on the gospel reading or rather my sermon is based on the gospel reading from John 2, 13 to 22. And my topic is, or my theme is, Our Father's House. The Wine and the Whip. John's Gospel, chapter two begins with Jesus' first recorded miracle, turning water into wine at a Jewish wedding in Galilee. This miracle involved conversion. And it reminds us of our first encounter with Christ. We are converted when we, when we receive him. We are converted. But then from the wedding, the scene shifts to Jerusalem, where Jesus cleansed the Jewish temple on two occasions, one near the beginning of his ministry and the other towards the end, according to what we see in the scriptures. The temple was known as a house of prayer not as a place where merchants took economic advantage of people. So to quote the scripture from John chapter two, verse 13 says, the Passover of the Jews was near and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found people selling cattle, sheep and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple with the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. So John is showing us that the miracle of conversion, taking water into wine, must be followed by cleansing. The wine represents how we should celebrate the goodness and joy of the Lord that makes, but it also 
But we also have to embrace the whip, which is correction, which is telling us how to clean up our lives and make it better. Now, the Passover was a yearly ce celebration. It was, celebrating, it was celebrating the deliverance of the children of Israel from Egypt bondage, Egyptian bondage. And Jews from all over the world came to Jerusalem for this celebration, which lasted like a whole, a whole week. But because of the distance that they traveled from, they, ha they didn't want to bring animals over that long distance because the animals had to be without blemish. And by the time they traveled that long distance, they might be ill or something. So the custom arose where the merchants gathered in the outer courts of the the temple and they would have their animals ready to sell to the people to, so the people could do their sacrifice. Since they were coming from different parts of the world, they had different coins, they had different, different, different um, the money was different, so they had to have it changed into the suitable currency. And of course, the merchants, would, the money changers, would tack on costs on, on this exchange of money. The people who had the animals would also increase the cost because they, um, they, they want to make a profit. And when they sold them in the temple, it was sometimes 25 times more than what they would have paid for them outside. So the Passover was supposed to be a spiritual celebration. But instead, there were people who were commercializing it. Almost something like how we commercialize Christmas. And we focus on the selling and the buying more than on the meaning of Christmas. So when Jesus walked into the temple, he would not be in the building, but there, there are courts outside of the temple. The Gentile court was where most of this selling and buying happened. He was stirred to action. He was observing what was going on, and he, was make, he, made, he took time to make a whip, or make a whip um, out of cords. He made a whip from cords that he found in the courtyard. And he began to drive the temple, the animals out of the temple. Picture a scene where there are hundreds of animals, hundreds, thousands of people in this outer court. And there's this hustle and bustle of buying and selling. And one man with a whip drove them out. And I mean, can you imagine it? It's almost like one of those, it reminds me of one of those movie, Western movies where the, the people had lasso, you know, the, the cowboys had lasso and, and they would throw the whip and lasso people and so on. But you can imagine one man with a whip driving all the cows and the sheep and the cattle and, the, well, the doves even. The, he, they had to open the cages and let the doves loose. And the people, and they were running from him. But that shows you the power of that Jesus had. He was in his humanness. And in his humanity, he was angry at what was going on in the church, the, the, the temple, which was supposed to be the house of God. And the scripture has said that the zeal of my house has eaten me up. He was so full of fury at what nonsense was going on in the temple that he drove them out and he said, take these things out of here. He turned over the tables of the money changers. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. So my theme today is our father's house. Jesus cleaned the, the Jewish temple on 
the, the, the scripture says it on more than one occasion. He was angry when he saw what was taking place in the temple. And Mark in 11, uh, Mark eleven seventeen says, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. So instead of being a house of prayer, a house of worship, it was just a crazy, dirty, filthy place with, with animals and, you know, people milling up and down and nobody paying any attention to what the real purpose of the celebration of the Passover was. So, we have to ask ourselves a few, questions, a few things when we look at this passage. We have to ask ourselves, what would Jesus expect to find if he came to our church today? Well, of course, he is here in spirit. But let's say he went into the, came into the, walked through the doors and came into the church. But all of us are sitting very calmly and quietly. I suppose are you listening to the sermon? And we already had our our worship. So are we comfortable? With what we feel that Jesus will be satisfied with the quality of our worship today. And there are a lot of things that I want to look at to find out whether Jesus, what Jesus would have thought of it, and what it should be, or what it could be rather than what it is. Well, let's talk a little bit about the temple. The temple was a small building, comparably small. It contained, you have heard about the holy place and the holy of holies into which only the high priest would go once a year and on the Day of Atonement to sacrifice for the people. So that you have the court of Gentiles into which anyone might come, but the Gentiles can go beyond that court. That was the outer court. Then there was the court of the Israelites, the court of the priests, and the court of the priests had um, the altar of incense, burnt offering, the seven branch lampstand, the table of showbread, and the great bronze bowl for ablutions. But the court of the Gentiles is the one we focus on because that is where all of this selling and merchandising was going on. And then the Jews, the Jews asked, after Jesus drove the people out, the Jews wanted to know by whose authority he was doing this. But I'm, it's amazing that they waited after he had driven them out to find out what authority he had to do it. And Jesus, they wanted a sign to see, well, are you, who are you? Who gave you this authority? And Jesus may have pointed at himself and said, okay, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Of course, they thought he was talking about the temple building. And they said that it, that took 46 years to build. How could he destroy it and raise it up in three days? But he was talking about his crucifixion and resurrection. Only the promised Messiah could do that. Now people believed him because of the miracles that he did, but still they didn't want to embrace him. And sometimes that's like the wine, you know, you, we, we, we like the, the good part, we like the, the miracles, but we don't want to do the clean up. Like the cleansing of the temple. Now today there's no need to worship in the temple as we did in Jesus' day. There's no more need for the animal sacrifices. 
When Jesus died on the cross, the veil in the temple was split in half, exposing the temple, the, the Holy of Holies, and the holy place. In other words, this Jesus brought in the new covenant whereby we could come straight to the Father in his name, through his blood, and we didn't have to wait, offer you a, an animal sacrifice and wait for the priest to offer the sacrifice so that you could get your sins forgiven. Are you glad that you don't have to go and buy sheep and animals to sacrifice if you've committed a sin to sacrifice the blood of an animal? You can imagine how cumbersome that would have been and how costly, especially for the poor people who could not afford these um, animals. You know, some couldn't, maybe could just afford a pigeon or a little dove or something. So after Jesus' resurrection, there's a new scene. We are now the body of Christ on earth. Christ was God's body. God was in Christ when he was on earth. After Jesus died and went back to heaven, now he sent back the Holy Spirit to dwell in us. So he is not limited to any particular place of worship now. He is in us. And so we become like the Father's house. And so we have to be careful with how we keep the house of God, which is our bodies, and also the house of God that we worship in. So we can offer praise to God anytime. We can come boldly to the throne of grace. We have access into the presence of God. Let's ask ourselves a few questions. Why do we come to church? Because it's tradition? Because you've been coming all the time? That's where you go to church? Do you have a purpose? Are you coming to meet God? Are you coming to worship in spirit and in truth? Are you coming to fellowship with your sisters and brothers? I'm going to look at some of these things. Number one, the real temple is you, me. I am the real temple of God. Ephesians, so what does Christ expect of us? He has some high expectations. And the first thing is, there are some things he wants us to put off. And there's some things he wants us to put on. So if he came to look at us today and see, well, who are these people worshiping? And what are, there are things that we need to put off and there are things that we need to put on. So Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20 to 24 gives us a clue as to some of the things that we should put off. We're told to put away your former way of life, your old self, corrupt and deluded by its loss, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to clothe yourself with the new, yourselves with the new self, created according to the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. That is a lot to digest, so maybe you remember that to look up that scripture to see the things that you need to put off. To put off means to divest yourself of something and take it off. Take off your clothes if you are putting off your clothes. Huh? So Paul is using the simplest of terms to illustrate what we must do in the realm of thought, of the attitudes of life. We must reject those basic assumptions that have caused our trouble, putting, off, putting them off and rejecting them, just as you put off dirty clothes. So we examine ourselves and we see, according to the word of God, what things we need to put off, which should not be a part of us. Before we accepted Christ, we were spiritually dead in sin. When we were born again, 
we were spiritually resurrected to a new life in Christ. And even though we are new creatures, we must still renew our minds with the word of God. So when we, uh, some people in the Methodist Church would have confirmed then, there's still a lot of things that have, this is where the, the whip comes in. You have to examine yourself. You have to renew your mind. The mind is an important thing in this. Because if we think the way we used to think, like the world, we're not going to please God. So we have to find out what God says about a particular thing or, and then have our minds renewed, change our mindset. So Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2 t tells us to, uh, Paul says, I appeal to you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that you may prove what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So we have to constantly renew our minds with the word of God. So we have to be delivered from the old mindset. We can't think like the world. We have to dethrone our idols. Anything that, that we have before our relationship with Christ is an idol. And he should be first in our lives. Paul gives us some more advice about putting off things in Colossians 3, 8 to 10. Where it says, but no, put them all away. Anger. I was asking the little children this morning about anger. Because there's anger, you can be angry. You have a holy indignation, righteous indignation about things. But we're not talking about this explosive anger that caused people to go and kill and stab each other and things like that. That is the world. That's how the world operates. But as children of God, we have to contain ourselves, our anger. But we have wrath, which is even a stronger word than anger. Malice, slander, and foul talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old nature with its practices and have put on the new nature which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. So it is the old nature and the new nature. So we put off the old and put on the new. So the first step in experiencing what God intends for us is to put off the old self and be renewed in the attitude of your mind. The new self is in the likeness of God. It is the life of God. It is the image of Jesus Christ. It is his life lived in you. So put on that kind of life it is available to you. When you believe in Jesus Christ and receive him as your Lord and Savior, he deposits the spirit within your heart. Hold that as a sacred trust between you and God. Separate yourself from the way unbelievers live. Live for the Lord. Just like Jesus didn't like the corruption of greedy money changers in the temple, he also doesn't like it when you let the pollution of this world get into you. Take care of, your, of the temple of your body that houses the Holy Spirit. And we could have a whole seminar on taking care of the body. We know that all the different health seminars that we go to and so on. But not only that, not only in the physical sense, you know, like nutrition, proper nutrition and so on, exercise and things like that. But in the spiritual sense, you wouldn't walk, you wouldn't walk into a beautiful cathedral and throw fast food wrappers all over the floor. 
So in the same way, protect your body, mind, and spirit, and keep them as healthy as possible. Then what would Jesus think of our worship? We are here in worship today. Remember when Jesus encountered the woman at the well? He told her that a time is coming when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Lord seeks. God is spirit and his worshipers must worship him in spirit and in truth. So that means, you know, the commandments say, love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. So if you love the Lord with all your heart, when you come into worship, you will be focused on him. You will adore him. You will, as you open your mouth to praise him, you'll be doing it in spirit and in truth not just from your lips. That's what that means. So God is looking for true worship. So appropriately worshiping God must be our first focus because we are created to worship. So while worship is a posture of the heart that begins with salvation, the scripture clearly teaches that it, is all, it also involves expressions like singing like we had nice singing today, singing, clapping, playing musical instruments, all of that is part of worship, so long as it is dedicated to the Lord. So we're looking at our Father's house, and it's a place of worship. The Bible also says that it is a place of prayer. It's a house of prayer and praise. We like to pray and petition God and ask him to do things and give him our shopping list. But in praying, we also need to praise him because he dwells in the praise of his people. And there are a lot of instances in the Bible where people praise God and miracles happen. For example, when Paul and Silas were in in, the, in prison and they praised, they were beaten, sore, and so on, but they praised God, and God delivered them out of the prison, out of the jail. When the people were walking around the walls of Jericho, for example, God told them, just walk around and don't say anything, and then just praise him on the seventh day. And after they praised, God used that. He came down into that praise. He dwells in the praises. So as we praise him, he comes in to manifest him, his power. So our Father's house is also to be a house of prayer and praise. So when we praise God, in, even in difficult situations, God will go ahead of you and he will cause a breakthrough for you. When you praise God, you place your focus on Jesus. If you have a problem, a situation, a sickness or whatever, a need, and you begin to praise God, you will focus more on his power and not so much on your problem. And you will see that his power and his name is greater than the power are greater than your problem. So your problem becomes minimized in your eyes when you start to focus on God and praise him. So when we praise God, praise defeats our enemy and grants us victory through divine intervention. Our praise puts the enemy to flight Now the Lord has promised never to leave us or forsake us. He is our helper through all of life's trials. We pray and he answers with wisdom and peace. Jesus suffered as a sacrifice, so we no longer need to sacrifice animals. 
His blood washes us white as snow. Therefore, we praise him. So let us come boldly to the throne of grace, where we receive his mercy when we need it most. Let us make prayer the most important aspect of our day-to-day -day living as a church and as an individual. Jesus prayed to the Father. He prayed all different kinds of um, ways. He, sometimes he went to the mountain to pray. He got up early in the morning. And you, when the disciples observed how after he prayed, he, he came down from the mountain after praying, and then he would go and heal the sick. Miracles would happen. So then that's why they asked him to teach us to pray, to teach them to pray. And then Peter was in prison, and the early church prayed for him. And he was delivered. And the early church made prayer a very important part of their life. They prayed before preaching, before traveling, before appointing people in the church. And we, in our church today, we should practice some of that. Another thing that Jesus would like to see in his house, God, in our Father's house, should be community and fellowship. In our Father's house, there should be fellowship among believers. Are we, in the, are we f having fellowship? Fellowship means in the same ship, fellows in the same ship. We are in the, in the same church. We are in the, in the building. Are we having fellowship with each other? The book of Acts tells us that the early disciples, after they started to grow in numbers, they devoted themselves, they, they still remain close, because they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to breaking of bread and prayers. So fellowship is very important for the Father's house, for us to have fellowship with each other. So every, every Christian needs to have fellowship with other Christians for the purpose of encouragement. When you fellowship with others, you get encouragement, accountability, camaraderie, camaraderie, bearing one another's burdens. You know, when you get into small groups, like in your classes and so on, you are able to share with your classmates, so to speak, you share some of your problems in those small groups, which you won't want to share in the big group in the church. And that's how we can build up each other. Ministry is also an important aspect of the Father's house. Every believer needs to be serving others in ministry. Many people think that ministry is the job for the pastor or the reverend only. However, Ministry is the, the privilege of every Christian to do, while the pastor's job or the leader's job is to equip the people for the works of service so that the body of Christ will be built up. So using our time, energy, abilities, and resources to serve others is a practical way for us to follow Jesus' command to love your neighbor as yourself. And Paul ad admonishes us to serve one another in love. Do we like to serve each other in love? Every Christian is called to do ministry in every way they can in order for the gospel to be proclaimed the kingdom to be built, and God to be glorified here on earth, just as it is in heaven. And the last one I would like to mention is mission. Every true believer's life should be characterized by mission. This is clearly seen in Jesus' Jesus's final command to his disciples when he told them, and you all are very familiar with this 
quote from Matthew 28, 19 to 20. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. So at the heart of the Great Commission is the task of making disciples. Therefore, evangelism is more than just decision making, getting people to make a decision for Christ. But we also have to take it a little further and disciple, teach them, groom them. Evangelism was a very important function in the early church. So that a lot of hundreds of people were converted through their ministry. Now, in the passage that we looked at with Jesus driving the people and animals out of the temple, it demonstrated his anger, his righteous anger. And Jesus always demonstrated, had anger against the hypocrites, against the Pharisees, like for example, the people who were religious but still were not relational, didn't have a good relation with God or other people. So the last lesson that we can learn from why in Jesus cleansed the temple is that God has righteous anger. He will only let things go down, go down and dark for so long. When people continue to do what is evil in the Lord's sight, his anger is provoked and eventually he will step in. God holds back from showing his anger because of his loving kindness, mercy, and forgiveness. He is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, and plentiful in mercy. As he waits for the people to stop their rebellion and come to him for forgiveness and hope. He doesn't wait anymore. He doesn't want anyone to perish. But he won't wait forever. Eventually, full and complete justice will come forth. He will return one day. No one knows the day or the hour, but he will return. If you are in Christ, this will be a glorious day. If you're not in Christ, he said, where I am, you cannot come. In the meanwhile, he advises us to use the opportunity that we have to make sure that our Father's house, individually and co corporately, is a house of prayer, praise, and worship, fit for the presence of the Holy Spirit. To God be the glory. Amen. You can spend a minute reflecting on the word, see how it, you can apply it in your life. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we open our hearts to receive your word. Your word has shown us the things that we can do in our Father's house to please you. We need the help of your Holy Spirit so that we can be guided in the right way and do the things that are pleasing in your sight. Let the word not depart from our minds, our hearts, and let it not return void, but let it accomplish 
in our hearts and our lives what you want have it to accomplish what you want to be accomplished today in the name of jesus we pray amen we're going to have our prayers of intercession at this point before we have our closing prayer Let us pray. Blessed are you, eternal God, to be praised and glorified forever. Almighty God, our Father, Heavenly Father, we come before you with humble hearts, trusting in your grace. We look to you from whom our help comes. You told us in your word in 2 Timothy 1 to 3, to make supplications, prayers, and intercessions for all men that we might live in peace. Inspire and lead those who hold authority in the nations of the world. Guide them and all people in the way, ways of justice and peace. We pray for all church leaders in the Methodist organization, as well as in other churches, that they would be good shepherds of the sheep. We pray that they would seek to know God's will, to be fruitful in ministry, and to be strengthened by intimacy with God. Let them be empowered by the Holy Spirit in their preaching, teaching, and administration. Let them have boldness to speak the matters of God and not to please man. Make us aware of the needs of our community. Help us to share each other's joys and burdens. Look with kindness on our homes and families. Grant your love, grant that your love may grow in our hearts. We bring the sick and shut-ins before you the elderly and people with chronic health conditions, asking that you bring them relief, healing and strength to endure. Those in our midst who may be sick right now or in pain, we declare that they are healed by the stripes of Jesus. May they receive it in Jesus' name. We pray for those who mourn, Almighty and merciful God, who heals those that are broken in heart and turns the sadness of the sorrowful to joy, let your comforting hands surround those who are mourning, especially because of the passing of a loved one. Jesus, you were a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. You wept at Lazarus' grave, even though you are the resurrection and the life. We pray for our unsaved family and friends that you send spirit-filled laborers across their paths to present the gospel to them. 
release them from Satan's bondage, and send the Holy Spirit to bring them to full repentance in the name of Jesus. We pray that God will bless the financial needs of the church, calling, belie calling believers to give generously and sacrificially through their tithes and offerings. We pray for the youth in the church, that they will stand strong for Christ in their schools and with their friends. Help each young person to follow God's plan for his or her life. Let them be strong against prayer pressure and the wiles of the devil and find a way to share their faith in school. We ask this in the name of Jesus with thanksgiving. And I will invite you to say the Lord's Prayer here because I didn't do it at the beginning. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Our closing hymn is number 384. O oh God, our Father, who does make us one.
Now unto him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, the glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. You may also say the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all.